Uh, so this morning we're in Genesis 34, so if you would open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 34, and I'm actually going to pick it up in chapter 33, and we left off last week at verse 17 in chapter 33. Uh, before I begin, I want to remind you of a couple of New Testament scriptures. One of them is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man and women of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture. That's why uh, here at Calvary we are take every Scripture and look at it and exposit it and think about it together because all scripture has benefit for us. Otherwise, uh, you come to a chapter 34 uh, in Genesis and you know my natural inclination is to just skip over this chapter because it's gross and evil, quite honestly. The behavior of Jacob's sons, uh, what happens to his daughter is a horrible, horrible thing. Off the charts, horrible. So, but the scripture says that all scripture is beneficial. Uh, Paul would write in Romans, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. So that's how we're approaching this this morning with confidence that God has a message for us. Jacob has traveled home from 20 years of uh, self-imposed exile uh, with his uncle Laban. God has revealed himself to Jacob, and God, at, at the end of 20 years, came to Jacob and said, go back to the land of your fathers. And we know from compiling different texts that what God was saying to Jacob was, go to the place where I first met you, which Jacob called a place, he called it Bethel, house of God. Whenever, you, by the way, whenever you see in the Old Testament, uh, or any New Testament, uh, a name or a place with the E-L ending or somewhere in the name, L is God, right? Elohim. So Bethel, house, Beth, house of God. So God was calling him back to the promised land, back to Bethel. And uh, as you know, if you remember, uh, he had some baggage, he had some skeletons in the closet, he had really hurt his brother Esau and he needed to reconcile with him and so he does. Uh, Jacob's whole family witnessed uh, Jacob. His children witnessed him um, you know, weeping and, and reconciling with his brother Esau. Uh, his family saw that and uh, as that uh, meeting with his brother Esau. He hadn't seen him in 20 years. His children had never seen Uncle Esau before. Um, you know, at the end of this time, this reunion together, um, Esau said, hey, why don't you come live in, down in my part of the world? And, and Jacob said, well, you go ahead, I'll meet you there. Uh, so Esau, you know, left, went back home, uh, and Jacob never went there. He never went there. So I'm telling you all that for a reason. Because uh, one of the primary characters in chapter 34 is his daughter, his only daughter, Dinah. Dinah was about seven years old when she met her uncle Esau. When she saw her dad lie to her brother. She heard that. Oh yeah, you go ahead, I'll meet you there. No, there's all this emotion, all this drama, right, as the two brothers met, as his dad and his, their new uncle, and introductions were made, and Dinah, you know, Esau reached down and pinched her little seven-year-old cheek, this adorable little girl, and then her dad said, you go ahead, I'll meet you there, but then never did, went there. He actually went in the opposite direction. Now, what are you going to do with that as a little kid? My dad's a liar. He's a hypocrite. Well, yeah, we, that happens. 
It's not what's caught or what's taught, it's what's caught, as they say in parenting. Uh, so that happened. Uh, chapter 33, verse 18, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. So he finally, after spending some time outside of the promised land, instead of going to Esau, he stayed on the east side of the promised land, the Jordan River. He finally crosses the river, finally goes into Canaan. Uh, Israel was known as Canaan at that time. And he goes to a city of Shechem, which is on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land in which he had pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar and called it El, there's God, Eloah, Israel. <laughs> so we have God, right? Uh, it means God and the house of God, I believe is what that means. Uh, it means God, the God of Israel. Sorry, God and the God of Israel. So there's that L uh, uh, name uh, reference to God throughout uh, this place that he erected an altar. So one thing I just want to clarify with you. We have a city called Shechem and we have a man named Shechem. So don't get confused. It is confusing. So to stop the confusion, uh, Shechem is a man who lived in a city by the same name. Okay, It's not that totally unusual. I grew up in a little town called Stanley. I didn't know anybody named Stanley, but there's certainly many people named Stanley. right? So if there had been, it could have been a Stan who lived in Stanley. right? This is Shechem who lived in Shechem. His dad was Hamor. Hamor was the mayor. He was the leader. He was the king. He was the main man. And his son Shechem was the prince. Okay? This is Canaan. This is Canaan. This is uh, a pagan culture, uh, polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. Um, and it was pretty perverse. And we know that from other texts throughout the Old Testament. Uh, particularly Leviticus, Leviticus 18, the famous Leviticus 18, which is a chapter that talks all about the sexual behavior of the Canaanites. And um, anything, it was covered about everything imaginable. That was normal for them. So Jacob has moved his family into the promised land where the Canaanites live. Uh, his daughter Dinah is old enough now to, we think that she's a teenager. And I can say that because her brother Joseph was born at about the same time as her. And we know in chapter 37 of Genesis that Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers betrayed him and sold him into slavery, human trafficking. Right? So because they were born around the same time, uh, we surmise that, that Dinah is probably about 14 to 16 years old at this point in her life. Okay? So here we go. It says, now Dinah. No, wait a minute. Let me stop for a moment. <laughs> okay? God called Jacob to go to Bethel. He didn't go to Bethel. He went back to the promised land, but he stopped short of the place that God had called him to go to. So he wasn't completely obedient, which means he was disobedient. And it cost his family it cost him dearly. If a man loves me, he will keep my words, Jesus said. And I'm going to give Jacob the benefit of the doubt. I think he loved God. But like you and I, he isn't always obedient. You know, there's something about our human nature that we can, in our minds, we can think oh yeah, I'm going to do the right thing, but then we don't actually do it. Right? And James would call us out on this in his little letter. Amen? 
He says, look, faith is, you're saved by faith alone. But it's not faith that's alone. What comes with our saving faith is a desire to do good works and to obey God. So it was a it was an incomplete obedience that caused Jacob a lot of trouble. By the way, um, it's said in chapter 33, verse 19, and I apologize for being a little bit uh, disjointed here. I'm trying to get up to speed. Um, it says that he bought a piece of land for some money. And it's from that verse that we think that um, the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she said, this is Jacob's well. And, and us, we Samaritans, we worship the God of Jacob who put a well in the ground. Well, that makes sense. If he bought the land, Jacob has a, a large farm. He's got cattle and, and, and flocks that need to be watered. And so no doubt once he bought the land, he put a hole in the ground so he could get water for himself and for his animals. So chapter 33, verse 19 is, is the one verse that it doesn't explicitly say that Jacob built a well or dug a well there, but um, just thought I'd throw that out there, that when you read your New Testament and you come to that famous story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she references Jacob in a well that he dug, and it's probably from this, this point in history here. All right, so it's good to see connection between the old and the new, right, as we get going here. But anyway, chapter 34, Dinah now is a teenage girl. It says, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Jacob spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this girl for my wife. All right? So... Yuck. Uh, Dinah's a teenager. She's uh, the only daughter. She has no sisters. She's living in Shechem. She's not living in Bethel where her dad should have taken her, but okay. Uh, she's a teenager. I think natural curiosity will give her a lot of benefit of the doubt here. And I would say to you, I don't think she's done anything wrong overtly. I don't think so. I think she's just a, a young teenage girl who finds herself living near this city of Shechem and natural curiosity is let's, what's going on in the culture around me with the ladies in this Canaanite world. Uh, she herself, again, uh, comes her, her dad and her mom Leah and the other ladies in her life, Rachel and the two others who were responsible for some of her siblings, half-siblings. Uh, they were God-fearers. So I'm going to suggest to you that Dinah actually maybe had a little bit more of a conservative lifestyle than the other ladies of the land. And that might have been attractive to Shechem as he observed her. All right? So I don't think that there's anything abnormal about Dinah's behavior. She's just a, a teenager who wants to see what's going on in the world. And so she goes into her social media, social platform, and goes out to see what's happening with the ladies in the world. The one thing that is problematic, though, is that she's alone. Not wise. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with her desire. But she is alone. That's an unwise thing. And actually, I, and I'm going to refer back to Jacob through this story. I put a lot of the, I hold him accountable that he would allow his daughter to leave home alone into a Canaanite culture, one that does not fear God 
and it has a lot of sexual deviancy. So I put a lot of the, I put a lot of the responsibility on him that maybe he didn't even communicate to his daughter what the expectations were, just some of the, the dangers. But certainly don't ever go alone, Dinah. I understand your curiosity. Why don't you get your brother Joseph, who's just maybe a year younger than you. He's a good man. Why don't the two of you go? Or maybe take mom with you. I know that's uncool, but, you know, she's an old woman and she's not cool. You know, because Dinah's a teenager after all, right? Uh, so out she goes and, uh, and that's what happened. Uh, Shechem the son of Hamor. Um, you can look at it at verse 2, and I'm going to rail on this for a minute, uh, but it says that he saw her, he seized her, he lay with her, and he humiliated her. So the language speaks of force. It speaks of uh, rape. Every 68 seconds, someone's raped in America. Now I'm going to throw out a few statistics. And these come from the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, RAIN, and from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Every 68 seconds. By the time we leave church here today, that means 120 women have been raped. 91% of victims of rape are female. 99% of perpetrators are male. It's men. It's men who are not controlling themselves. 99 out of 100 times it's going to be a man who perpetrates against 91% of the time, 9 out of 10 times a woman. 1 in 5 women are sexually assaulted while in college. Over 80% of sexual assaults are committed by an acquaintance, not by a stranger. More than 90% of sexual assault victims on college campuses don't report it because they're afraid of the reprisals, the shame that comes with it. On an annual basis, rape costs the U.S. more than any other crime, $127 billion on an annual basis, more than Assault, murder, and drunk driving. Isn't that interesting? It's the most costly crime in America. I never knew that. He saw. He seized. He lay with her. He humiliated her. Ladies, Men are more likely than women to consume pornography. Why? Because we're visually oriented. According to a 2020 survey, 2022 survey, 44% of men have reported watching pornography in the last month, in the time of that survey, compared to 11% of women. Unfortunately, women are beginning to consume pornography more more than ever before. But the point I'm trying to stress with you ladies, and I'm going to speak to you men here in a moment, is that men are visually stimulated. They just are. Knowing the culture, this this ancient Middle Eastern culture, Dinah, I'm sure, was dressed very modestly. Very modestly. Which makes obvious that the point is not with Dinah, it's with Shechem. It's what's going on in his heart. I don't think that she was, I don't think there was a lot to see there in Dinah. It was just 
dressed probably very normally with with less of the rest of the ladies in that city. But just ladies, I just want you to know that, that it happens, that men are stimulated visually. Again, in this thing I noted here, men in their 30s and 40s report the most frequent use of pornography. With 50%, 57% of men ages 30 to 49 reporting having watched pornography in the past month. According to a 2023 survey, 77% of women reported never watching online porn. All right, so my point is made. <laughs> okay, uh, ladies, just be aware. Right? But to the men, to the men, I just want to make a point, and, and to make my point here about Shechem is that uh, rape doesn't just happen, okay? Uh, it's the outcome of lust that has been, not been controlled, all right? So go with me in just a, a thing that I did in imaginary way for here for Shechem, because he's Prince Shechem. His dad is the leader of this city called Shechem. So he's a man of power and of wealth and of influence. He's the prince, for heaven's sakes. So I just, in my own mind, I, to make my point that it doesn't just happen, it's something that Shechem had allowed himself to, to, to look and to look again and to look again and to fantasize. And he, and he never brought his, his lusts under control, right? We as godly men, as spirit-filled men, have the advantage of the cross and of the spirit of Christ living in us. And we can take take control. And we do find victory. And it happens on a day by day and a minute by minute basis. Amen. And we live victoriously. Shechem not the case. Right? So here's my, my point of going through this little imaginary exercise with you is to just show you that it doesn't just happen. It's ridiculous. So imagine with me uh, that uh, Shechem, the prince, uh, he's up early. 5.45 5.45 a.m., right? He's a busy guy. He's the prince. And so 6 to 7 o'clock, he's off to the gym, uh, hit the weight room, of course, checked himself in the mirror all the time, uh, do a little racquetball with the boys, home at 7 to 8 for a shower, breakfast, and a briefing from his personal assistant on the day's busy schedule. And here's how the schedule looks that day. From 8 to 8.20, go to the temple, burn some incense, to appease the gods. From 8.30 to noon, you have a cabinet meeting. You've got to meet with your, with your officials because there's very important things to be aware of on a regular basis. Number one, we need to hear from the water authority, all right? Because they live off of dug wells. And what's the status of the wells? Uh, he's running a city. He needs to hear from the head of security, right? And there's a secretary of state. After all, there is a new family in our vicinity. And who are these people? And they're foreigners and so on and so forth. And so there's all these things going on. And then from noon to one is lunch with your father. From one to two, you take your afternoon siesta. From two to two thirty, go back out into the city, meet the people, go to the temple. From two thirty to three, rape Dinah. From three to three thirty, there's an interview with CNN. And then from three thirty to five, there's a speech to the students at the university in the, humanitar- in the uh, humanities department. It doesn't just happen. You see my point? It never just happens. Adultery doesn't just happen. It's, it's a man not taking control of his flesh. So how do you fight sexual temptation? I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, bring that up to all of us in the room, men or women. And I'll give you uh, just several things that I and we all know. And I want to encourage you to, number one, be aware. Be aware of yourself. What triggers that flame inside of you? Is it being alone, like Dinah? Is it being alone with with access to the internet? Then be aware of that. Be aware of what triggers. Fight, say no, flee, (laughs) repent. That's, the, that's New Testament scripture, by the way. Paul counseling young pastor Timothy, flee youthful passions. Flee them. Get out of the room, Timothy, when, when temptation comes, when 
sexual temptation comes your way. So be aware. Number two, be together. We are the body of Christ. Have sisters, have men that you can, that you trust, that you can confide in, that you can be transparent with, right? And just say, bro, would you help me? I'm, I'm, I'm in a period of struggle right now. Had that conversation many times, mutually. Sometimes very honestly. So be aware, be together, be in prayer. Pray. So as we're aware, as the, the temptation and that, that those thoughts are you know, constantly bombarding your mind, you are fighting against that in prayer. And you're being very honest and you're saying, God, I am struggling with, and you say it out loud or you say it to the Lord who knows all things and can hear your heart and voice. And you say, Lord, please help me. I can't shake this thing. And I will also say this, that I've had seasons of unrelenting uh, sexual temptation, and it's all in my mind, but after several days or maybe a week, I start to finally wake up and you go, and I so you go, maybe there's more than just me going on here. Maybe there's an enemy. Maybe there's a devil who has shot a fiery dart that has found its way past my shield of faith and it's stuck inside of me and it's burning. And so then I'll say, Lord, if there's demonic activity, would you please quench that and, and set a hedge around my heart and mind? So I encourage you in that, ladies and men, gentlemen. All right? Be aware. If there, if, be aware of your triggers. Stay together. Stay in honest, transparent fellowship with people that you love and trust and that you can walk through life together with. Be in prayer, just as I have described. I was so impacted by my friend years and years ago. And I might have said this story, but maybe not to you, this audience, but he lived in New York City at the time and he was trying to kick the nicotine habit. And he had to walk from his office back to his apartment and on his walk, I don't know the street, but it was somewhere in Manhattan, and there were all these little smoke shops. And so he's trying to stop smoking, and he's walking past the smoke shop, and, he, and all the temptations are so strong. And uh, he was telling me, as he was walking along, he's like, no, Lord, no, I'm not Lord. And he's just praying the whole time. And he finally said, I finally got to my apartment. I was past all the temptation. And he started complaining and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Pray all the time? And then he just smiled and we smiled at each other. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's walking in the spirit. And then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's walking in the spirit. And then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you know what? A little victory and there's confidence. And then there's a fall and God forgives and we repent and then we get back up and we go again and greater confidence and greater confidence. And it's part of our sanctifi sanctifying process. Be aware. Be in prayer. Be together. Take a shower. <laughs> I know that's probably a weird thing to say in the context of sexual temptation. Take a cold shower. Well, maybe you should. But when I say take a shower, I mean wash your brain with the water of the Word. You've got to have truth that you're holding on to. Truth that you're applying to your situation. Reading the Scriptures. It's the Word of God. What's Hebrews 4.12 tells us? It's like a double-edged sword. And, and it can penetrate and reveal and expose and encourage areas in your heart and mind that, that really no counselor can do. No therapist can do. The Word of God. And then with the power of the Holy Spirit and our obedience to the Word of God, we grow in our confidence and we become more holy. All right? So be aware be together, be in prayer, take a shower, washing your mind with the Word of God. And then finally, 
And I heard this from Chuck Swindoll. Maybe you don't know him. I think he maybe is in heaven, but I, we were brand new Christians a long time ago. And he was on the radio, and I, he, he, he said, and I've never forgotten it, he said, you know, before you go venturing off into some sin, some sexual sin, just sit down and write down the names of all the people that would be affected when you get caught. Because you're going to get caught. And I encourage you to do that, friends. Sit down and write it out. The names of your immediate family. What's going to happen when your parents, when your siblings, when your grandparents, or your children, or your spouse hear what you've done? Write down the names of your extended family, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. Write down the name of your friends. Write down the name of people you have witnessed to in all good sincerity and in faith, talking to them about Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, that came home to me as I was preparing for this message and going through this exercise myself, that came home to me so powerfully because it was just two weeks ago I was at a graduation party and a friend of mine who's not a believer and I've witnessed to this person several times, he introduces me to another person and right out loud in front of the whole graduation party, anybody that was listening, he said, oh, here's Scott Hathorne. He's a pastor, you know. I'm like, well, how you do? <laughs> you know, now this person knows who I am. And I thought, if I did something stupid and got caught, what's my friend going to think? That's a Christian? That's a pastor? You see, when you start writing it out, you realize you're pretty well connected, people. There's a lot of people that know you. A lot more than might come to mind. And we go insane when temptation comes and we think, oh, I can do this. And get away with it. And the consequence, the outcome of that. Think about your neighbors in your dorm room, the ones you live around. What are they going to say about the people you see every day? How about your work associates? I thought it's interesting. We just had a meeting with the architect here this past week, right? Alex Mergold is the architect that we're using to design the sedition that we're praying about. And I thought, what would he say? He's not a Christian. We've had multiple conversations. Very interesting ones. <laughs> right? Because he's got all these interesting ideas. And he's like, where are you going to get the money for this? I said, I don't know. We're broke. We're at the Red Sea, Alex. You know what the Red I, I know what the Red Sea is. Well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I said, anything's possible. Mary was a virgin and became pregnant. He's like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> that's my friend Alex. What's he going to say? You see, friends? Write it down. It can be a good deterrent for us. Before going on, uh, in, spite of, in light of the statistics that I read there, I just do want to make uh, available to you this information. There is a resource um, that you may want to know about personally, or maybe you could pass that on to somebody else. Uh, if you are unfortunate uh, victim of sexual abuse, uh, there is that 24-7 uh, hotline. It's associated with the RAIN organization that I mentioned there. Um, and that is uh, super confidential and uh, I encourage you to make contact with them to begin a process of healing. But you know, before I go on, I wanted to say I'm so thankful for Jesus Christ. Because, you know, it, it takes his encounters with women in the New Testament and it brings such hope and such healing. That woman in, in Luke chapter 7 who was a prostitute, she came in and she's weeping with faith over the Lord's feet. 
And Jesus said, her sins are many, but she's forgiven because she's believed in me. The Lord's encounter with the woman at the well. She's had five husbands, she's living with a man. And yet he gave, he revealed himself to her more clearly than in almost anyone else. In literally saying to her, I'm the Messiah. And I'm not condemning you. The woman caught in adultery. Go and sin. I don't condemn you. She's a woman. Where was the man? Well, the Pharisees had an attitude towards women. There's been an attitude towards women since the fall. That wasn't the case when God designed man and woman. There was a mutuality and a love and a mutual respect. But with the fall came all kinds of problems. And Jesus restored so much and brought so many things back into a good order. Demonstrating that personally with his life with his words, with his kindness. Many women followed him. Many women. And supported him in his ministry. He revealed himself to a woman in the garden. The very first human being to ever see Jesus raised from the dead was a woman in a garden. Just reversing the damage done by a woman in a garden back in Genesis. Grace abounds. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I guess I can get off that hobby horse. Shechem saw her Caesar lay with her Amelia. Verse 3, his soul was drawn to Dinah. You know, it's just worth saying, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, that uh, sex is more than just a physical encounter. All right? Paul teaches us that. Uh, those who sin with your body, it's more than just that. And it's very evident here. It says that he loved her. He loved her as best he could. He was infatuated with this young lady, right? But he certainly doesn't know how to love her like God loves people, right? But um, it says his soul was drawn to Dinah. You know, in some respects, uh, as much of a jerk as he was, uh, give him credit for the fact that he at least is now taking responsibility for this young lady. So he says, get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah. Don't you wish there was something more said than that? There's just silence. He heard. He did nothing. Again, I put a lot of the the problem here on Jacob. First for his example to his impressionable seven-year-old in that she heard him say things and do then another and then He let her go out alone, and now when he hears about it, he doesn't do anything about it. Um, But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they had heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. Notice, by the way, it's the first time that the land is referred to as Israel. Right? Because Jacob's name had changed Israel, he's now in the land, and they just, it's all kind of one and the same. Her brothers, her older brothers, are uh, responding very appropriately at this point. There's like indignation, like, whoa, something needs to be done. So Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves on an equal yoke here. It's an unwise offer, but he's a salesman. He's trying to to get Jacob to agree, right? They come from two different worldviews entirely. Uh, Verse 10, you shall dwell with us and the land shall be opened to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem, who's, you know, Prince Shechem, uh, the guilty one, is standing there looking at her father and uh, her uh, brothers Uh, And he says, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me I will give. Uh, Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will and I will give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. So he's like, I'll hand you a blank check. Right? Kind of a thing. 
So the sons of Jacob, and this turns very dark here, I'm sorry to say. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Uh, You know, by the way, it's interesting that circumcision, as you know, uh, friends, was the sign of the covenant that God had given to Abraham. Genesis 17. So God made a promise, he made a covenant with Abraham. He goes, oh, and then the sign of the covenant is circumcision. Well, that was long before Jacob's boys were born. So I find it interesting that his sons have been circumcised, explicitly stating or implying, obviously, that Jacob had talked to his boys about God, about God's covenant, about his grandpa Abraham and his father Isaac and and that covenant that he now is on his shoulders and and their need to live in faith and faithfully with God. So that's been communicated to these boys. They know what they're talking about. And so they're, they're like, you know, we have different worlds here. We, we share the same geographic area, but we're not of your world, okay? Because of Almighty God who's creator. Uh, and so, verse 15, only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Every male among you being circumcised. Not just Shechem, and they're not, and, and by the way, they're not, they're not encouraging, they're not witnessing to Hamor and Shechem about God and how wonderful he is and gracious he is, their experience, none of that, right? They're, they've, it's blasphemy. They're taking the sign of the covenant and they're using it for personal gain. It's, it's, it's dark and it's horrible. Then, he says, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. Interesting. Shechem was a, in that culture, was seemed to be a fairly good man, for the most, in some ways. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of the city. That's where you conduct your business, and they spoke to the men of their city. Now they got a lot of work to do here to try to sell this deal to all the men of the city. And so they, the way they do that is by, here's what they say: these men are at peace with us, let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are, will not their livestock and their property and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell. So there was a they, they promote it as a monetary gain. Okay? Hey man, you're going to get wealthier. You're going to be better off for this. Well, they agreed. So all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Uh, so this is an ancient world. Uh, this is not a clean... Uh, sterilized, uh, you know, engineered uh, tools that were used for the operation (laughs) with shiny, stainless, unbelievably sharp. It It was a stone. 
these guys were sore. <laughs> they were in a lot of pain. And on the third day, um, probably at that point, uh, maybe even infection, uh, just really, really uncomfortable. Two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. I hate that. I can't imagine that. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. He was holding her hostage. I mean, these guys were, they weren't unconscious, the, the Shechemites. Simeon and Levi went in and they looked them right square in the eye and hacked them up. By the time they got all done, they are just covered with blood. It is the most, it is off the charts evil. Unbelievable. Don't think they got away with it. Because as we sang, every knee is going to bow. They are going to be held accountable. They were held accountable when they met God. And God will deal with them justly. Verse 27, now the other brothers get engaged, the sons of Jacob. Once the two had done all the evil, then the other brothers came in and plundered the city because they defiled their sister. They took their flocks, their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city in the field, all their wealth and their babies, their children, their wives, all that was in the houses, and they captured and plundered. What's Jacob say to all that? Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. Really, Jacob? Is it all about you? Is there not a rebuke? Is there not a, 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 a call to repentance? To your own sons? Unbelievable. Their response to their dad? Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? And you guys, you got to understand, in that culture, you just did not talk to your father in such an open, sort of rebuking, corrective manner. You just didn't do that. Jacob has lost control of his home. And it started with a compromise. So to wrap this gruesome story all up, that's what I would say the encouragement to us is walk in the light as he is in the light. And we'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. From all sin. Live for the Lord, brothers and sisters. Jesus will forgive anything that you do. And it doesn't give us license to do anything we want to do. It actually keeps us from doing anything we want to do because of his great love and compassion and grace toward us. It's grace that keeps us. We're kept by the power of God through faith. You got those two things working, Peter would teach us. We're kept by the power of God. I know, brother and sister, I know. You might be going, where was the power of God here? Where was it? Why didn't he step in? Why did he allow such a horrible evil? I don't know. But I know it doesn't change his character. Not one bit. And if he's allowed this to happen, then he's got a reason for that. And he will make that known. And they will be held accountable. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul said, that makes me shake in my boots. Because the things that I have said, the lifestyle that I have lived, Paul said, you want to follow Christ? Watch me. 
And follow me as I follow Christ. Be imitators of me. Oh my goodness, Paul. Yeah, live with me for a while. Watch my devotions. Watch me stumble. Watch me repent. Watch me witness. Watch me stumble around in the, in the darkness at times. I have fears. Paul had fears. Paul came to Corinth. He was overwhelmed by the culture of Corinth. He was like, I got, I got to get out of here. God said, don't go. I've got many people in this city. You preach the gospel. It's the power of God to heal, to bring victory, to break change, to change lives and put us on a whole new course and to put us into a body together. You know, it's, I'll tell you what, I was talking a lot about this sermon this week because I didn't want to preach. Who wants to go through that? But you know, I was having a great conversation with Joni. And you know what we ended up talking about? We ended up talking about an opposite example. And that would be Boaz and Ruth. Boaz was a powerful, wealthy, influential, single man. Boaz. And we know that because in chapter 2 of Ruth, it says he goes out to his, all his employees who are harvesting his grains, and he says to his people, the Lord bless you. I mean, he's a faithful man of God. Faithfully going about his work. He, he had fought in battles, and he's living at a time, by the way, where it tells us in the very last verse of chapter of Judges, it says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the last words of Judges. And it says in, chapter, in, in Judges, it says, in the days when the Judges ruled, in the days when everybody's doing was right in their own eyes, along comes a godly man and a godly woman named Ruth who'd been married and widowed and childless, finds herself unwanted singleness, but she's there. And she surrenders her whole life to God as she's on her way back into the promised land. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. She's saying this to her mother-in-law, Naomi, as they're heading back into the Israel. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. That is powerful because her mother-in-law is much older than her. And she's assuring her, hey mom, don't worry, I'm all in. I love God. And after you pass, I'm going to keep loving God and I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to worship the God Almighty. Your God, the God of Israel. She was in. Well, the story goes on, right? Boaz comes to his field one day and there's Ruth. She went out of her home alone. But she didn't go out just out of curiosity. She went out to go to work to provide for her widowed mother-in-law because they're women. They don't get a lot of respect. They're, very, they're dirt poor. She said, I'll go work in the fields and I'll bring us some food. And she shows up in the field and Boaz saw her visually stimulated Aha. Uh-huh. But what does he see? He sees a godly woman. And there's the heart of a godly man responding. And Boaz said to Ruth, now listen my daughter, do not go to glean in any other field or leave this one, but keep close by my young women. You want to get to know the ladies <coughs> in town? That's a good thing. Stay with them. And then he said, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? He immediately provides protection. What a good man he is. Right? And I'm just suggesting to you, it's the opposite of every, all the gross stuff we've talked about before. Here's a man who, is, who has conquered his flesh, who's got every possibility he could... Influence, he could exert his own influence and, and just say, oh, here's a foreign girl, and I think I'll just please myself at her expense. He could have done that as Shechem had done, 
But he's like, no, no, no. I'm serving the, the Lord Almighty. And he responds in such a positive and a beautiful way. I've told my men, don't lay a hand on you. And if they do, they got to answer to me. Because I'm paying them, by the way. Not only going to lose their job, they're going to lose their respect. I've told them to think about the consequences of what would happen if they crossed a line. You see, the, the dangers were the same. But when you have a, a spirit-filled, God- filled person on the scene, it changes everything. Is it just me? But doesn't it seem like in America today, everybody does what is right as their own eyes. It's like, this is what I want to do, that's what I'm going to do, therefore it's authentic, I feel this way. And my feelings are authentic, and therefore you need to accept that. And if you don't, then you have hate speech. And craziness is spun out of control. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, brothers and sisters. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul would tell young Timothy, who was a man who God had raised up into a place of leadership within the church in Ephesus. Ephesus, oh my goodness, I could go on and on and on. Ephesus had the great temple of Artemis, which was a a Greek goddess of love. And it it was the the culture in Ephesus was unbelievably bad. And it also had an occultic, a demonic activity was very strong there. And Paul plants a church right in Ephesus. Then he moves on and he takes this young buck named Timothy and he says, you pastor the thing. And with that comes leadership. People look at you, Timothy. He was afraid. Paul said, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Self-control. Walk in that, Timothy. Let other people see the reality of God in your life. Your friends and neighbors, the people you've witnessed to. And they'll come. Believe me, they'll come. They're going to come out of that because it's not satisfying. There's more involved in sexual love than as as we saw in the text. His soul is now attached to this woman. But he didn't want responsibility. So. Sorry I rambled on. (laughs) Let's stand and pray. Lord, I thank you so much, not only for Boaz and for Ruth and and the, oh my goodness, Lord, they are like a shining jewel displayed on a, a very dark background, like a jeweler, it comes to my mind. Everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. And there's this precious display of just simple faith, your glory. Lord, you step down into this darkness with your own life. And you are the light of the world. And you became the ultimate, the supreme and superior display of godliness and holiness and power. Thank you, Lord. I pray for your spirit to bring healing, to bring hope to anybody that's been affected from, by abuse. Please, Lord. We look to you. We look to your spirit. We look to those who you have who are wise in counseling in these matters. And we pray for an increase of of true healing and recovery and restoration and freedom from trauma and anxiety. True freedom, Lord. It's what you promise. We thank you for the gift of your spirit 
and the ability to fight. Lord, just the fact that we're even in the fight, that I care now. I care that I don't do the things I want to do and I don't do the things I should do. I care about that. It's, it's a evidence of you living in us. Thank you, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a good week. Bye. <laughs>